Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with Der Knopf, Hans Knoppertsbusch, part two, the Decca Opera Box, since we've already covered the orchestral box. Now, in the orchestral box, it was pretty definitively established that Maestro Kna was pretty much a mediocrity. He was amiable, people liked him, he was relaxed and friendly and jolly, and really didn't give a damn what happened in the course of the performance. He was also not particularly interested, as we all know, in rehearsals. And, uh, you know, I, he was a local talent. That's what, that's the bottom line. He really was. And I also was thinking about this, actually. And I really wondered, oh, that beep, by the way, was just, you know, the, the potatoes baking. But we don't need to worry about that. Anyway, I really think we need to ask ourselves, I'm just very curious about the effect that the Second World War had on artists like Knoppert's Bush. He really had no ability to do anything outside of Germany, particularly, partic I mean, he did make a Richard Strauss disc in Paris. I mean, you know, but basically he was very limited in repertoire. He only, as an opera conductor, did the German standards. He did Wagner and Beethoven and those people. He wasn't even that great as a Beethoven or Brahms conductor as often as not. I mean, he could deliver the goods on certain occasions, but most of the time he didn't. So what was he going to do in the new Germany after he had been denazified? It's not a question of whether he was a Nazi or not a Nazi. I don't want to get into that. His career was pretty much effectively destroyed by the Nazis while they were in power, although he was able to sort of find work most of the time. And then he had to be denazified after the war. And after the war, he was really out of sympathy with the new Bayreuth style of Wagner staging and interpretation, about which he had no say whatsoever. And you have to wonder how much he really cared. I think that's a, a very serious question that's worth considering. Although, you know, that's a biographical issue. Our concern is entirely with the musical results. And the advantage of opera, even for those who say, well, he was basically an opera conductor, he wasn't an orchestral conductor, is the reason he was basically an opera conductor is because opera is a collaborative effort. And by far the most important thing about it is not the conductor at all. It's the singers, even in Wagner, even in the conductor operas. It's still all about singing. And if you have a great cast, then, <laughs> you know, 90% of the battle is over. Sure, a conductor can wreck it, but most of the time you're in pretty good shape. And not only that, if the conductor respects the singers and the singers have very firm ideas about things like tempo, then the pacing of the thing is going to be the result of a collaborative effort. And even beyond that, for somebody who was you know, immune to the joys of rehearsing and who did not want to like go through all that stuff, opera has rehearsal conductors as most symphony concerts do not. I mean, some days they, sometimes the big, big guys, they have them. They do. They have rehearsal conductors who prepare and then the, you know, the big man scoots in on the day. That was like Gurgiev's thing. He always used rehearsal conductors. But, but in the opera house, in the opera house, you do have them. They, you have repetitors and people who prepare the singers and prepare the chorus and do all that extra work and the orchestra before they all get together. And in Der Knaas' case, he had rehearsal conductors such as Herbert von Karajan, for example, for his Meistersinger recording. Rumor has it, and there was Clemens Krauss sitting around out there in the wings, and there were there were Kempe, and I mean, all those guys who went on to do their own ring cycles later were there, and they were able to assist. And I think that, of course, Knoppers Bush got the credit for the work all of those people in the background did. And that is one of the reasons why his opera recordings may have come off more successfully, which is not to take away anything from the actual sound of the performance on the day. But all of those things matter, and all of those things tend to act as a counterbalance to his general lassitude and unconcerned casualness. Um, in front of the orchestra. So let's talk about what's in here, because there really is a lot of really great stuff in here. This is much, much, much 
better than the orchestral box. And like I said, the reason is primarily because of the singers. I mean, the singers in Vienna after the war, it was one heck of a group of singers in the German repertoire area. So let's see what we get. First, we get Fidelio. Well, Fidelio has Annalisa, no, no not Annalisa Rothenberger, I'm just kidding. Um, Fidelio has, uh, let's see, let me get to the cast here on page three. Or, oh, there they are. Yes, uh, Floristan is Jan Pierce, who is excellent, absolutely excellent. Leonora is is uh, Sena Uranats, who's not bad. I don't think she's fabulous, but she's not bad. And you've got Rocco, you've got Desso Ernster, and you've got Marcelina as Maria Stotter. I mean, these are Murray Dickey, is, is, is Iacchino. I mean, it's a very, very good cast. The problem here is, in fact, Knoppert's Bush, who is slow. Act one is supposed to be all lightness and farce. Well, it's a farce, but not for this, not for the reason Beethoven intended. It's just slow. It's just heavy. It's so heavy. And then, of course, you know, the dungeon scenes go better because they can be dark and gloomy and sort of slowish. It's okay. And Pierce is a very, very good voice. But, you know, my, my colleague Jed and I were chatting about this because he's doing the review of this box on ClassicsToday.com where you'll be able to listen to it with some sound clips. So if you're an insider member, do run over there when this runs. It will run this week sometime. Um, please, you know, if this is the year 2775, it's already there. But if you're watching this in real time, when I post it, it's coming very shortly. So just keep your eye out. That's all. But the bottom line is, the bottom line is that, you know, the duet with, you know, oh, Namen Lose Freude. Oh, my God. Oh, Namen, Namen Lose Freude. Oh, yeah. Nameless joy, mm -hmm. like, like you've never heard it before. Although it can work when it's done slowly. You know, Leonard Bernstein famously took it slowly. He really did. But, it, you know, the character is there, the singing and the rhythm is there. I mean, rhythm, you know, like rhythm, rhythm. Knappert's Bush and rhythm were, were not friends. Let's put it that way. So, you know, Fidelio is so-so. Then we get, let's see, Die Valkyrie. Um, let's see. Oh, Tristan and Isolde excerpts with Birgit Nielsen and Grace Hoffman. Nothing not to love. It's Birgit Nielsen. I mean, how can you blow it with Birgit Nielsen? She's outstanding, although her studio effort, her later one with Fritz Uda, unfortunately, is Tristan or whatever his name was, wasn't so great. But she did a couple great Isoldes, especially the Carl Böhm one. Ah, oh, boy. She's, she, you know. What's, 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 you can get her as old in any number of ways, but she's young, she's fresh, she's raring to go, and so that's fine. And then we've got, let's see, Die Valkyrie Act One with Kirsten Flagstad, Sets Van Holm, and Arnold Van Mill. This was recorded, let me see, in 57. Flagstad was, you know, well past her prime as Sieglinda. Um, she was always a little matronly, even when she wasn't past her prime. Now she's really past her prime, but it's Flagstad. You know, people who love the voice and remember the voice and opera singers, you know, opera fans, that is, you know, they tend not to care too much because they're very personality oriented. Um, I think that there are better Valkyra Act Ones. But, you know, and Arnold Van Mill, but Sets Van Holm is good as Sigmund, and Arnold Van Mill is okay as Hunding, and, you know, it's, 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 it's nice. I mean, you know, and Knoppert's Bush is a little sluggish, <laughs> as usual. He's a little sluggish. Then we get the Meistersinger. This is the real surprise. The Meistersinger is really delicious. What's is fascinating is that the prelude in this performance is eight minutes and 49 seconds long. In the orchestral stuff, there are some Meistersinger preludes that I think are go up to about like 12 minutes maybe or something like that. I, you know, it's really kind of remarkable how different he could be and seemingly without any particular concern as to which way it ought to go. Um, it's just the way it went on the day. Some people call that spontaneity. I call it complete lack of concern <laughs> as to what makes music sound its best. I mean, at some point, you got to take a position on these things, you know? Anyway, it's a really light and lively and delicious Meistersinger. This is the performance that was theoretically prepared by Carrion. I don't know what that had to do with it, but it's nice to know. It's sort of a backstory. It's a delightful performance. You've got Paul Schiffler, Otto Edelman. Um, let's see, who's, who's Ava? Ava is, is, is uh, what's her name? 
Oh, there she is all the way down at the bottom here. Oh, yeah, Hilda Gooden. I mean, it's really a very, very good cast. And it's, it's a delightful Meister singer. It's one of the, sort of the great unknown, unsung Meister singers. People don't usually talk about it because they're so obsessed with his Parsifal. But this was recorded in 1950 and 51 over the, over the cusp in the fall and, and winter of 5051. And it's really, really nice to hear with the Vienna Phil. I, I, you know, one of Knopfritz Bush's best recordings. No question about it. And surprisingly just appealing. I happen to think Meistersinger is a marvelous opera to listen to if you don't care about the words. I mean, it just plays. It's wonderful to put on as background music. It flows nicely. It's good for when you're driving. It's, it, it's such a listenable, pleasant piece of music for the most part. And this is just a delightful performance. So that's great. Now we get the Parsifals. There are two of them. Now, as everyone knows, everybody, gosh, everybody knows, there was, uh, they have sort of similar casts and places. The first one was from 51. Yes, here it is. Live from Bayreuth with Wolfgang Windgassen, George London, Arnold Van Mill, Ludwig Weber, um, Hermann Ude, Martha Mödel, and all those people. And it's a marvelous Parsifal. It really is. I happen to feel, and this is just me, that Parsifal is possibly the dullest piece of music ever conceived by the human mind. I have no sympathy for it whatsoever. I think the story is just ridiculous and stupid and philosophically offensive. However, there's always a however. The music itself in bits is moment by moment one of the most gorgeous things ever conceived by the human mind. I mean, it's just gorgeous music, beautiful, beautiful music. It just dies on the vine. However, the fact that I feel that, you know, the piece is just, you know, kind of nonsensical and, and dull does not mean that I cannot appreciate a great performance of it. And I like these Knopfritz Bush performances, both of them, because they have that tension of a live performance. They have the right flow. They're not too slow. They're not in the sense that you feel that it's dragging. You, you don't get that sense, I don't think, with these performances. They're, they're just lovely. And the cast is wonderful. And great singing is great singing. I don't care if they're singing the, you know, the Vienna Telephone Directory. If they're doing it wonderfully, then I'm, I'm happy. So when I want to listen to Parsifal, which happens maybe once every 10 or 20 years, I generally pull out Canopard's Bush. I really do because I, for, for, they give me pleasure. What can I say? That's how I feel about it. And uh, both of them, I really have no problem with either. But let's see, what's the second one? We know it was with, um, yeah, with Jess Thomas, George London, Marty Tavolo, who's like fabulous and young as Titterell, and Hans Hotter as Gurnemans, and Gustav Needlinger as Klingsor. Oh, gosh, the, you know, the guy who does, you know, the most evil, evil dark roles in the world. And Irene Dallas as Kundry. And it's wonderful. It's just wonderful. It's a marvelous performance. Now, this one is the stereo one from 62. And I think probably of the two, it's marginally better, and it certainly sounds better. But I can understand people preferring 51 for the singers. Because Knopfritz Bush is basically the same guy either place. It's about the singing. And these are great, great performances. And a wonderful legacy to a sincere mediocre conductor, but very sincere. Wagner tends to attract mediocre conductors. Think about Reginald Goodall, who was the king of Wagnerian mediocrity. I mean, next to him, Knopfritz Bush was Toscanini. But, you know, you, you, you see what I mean. So that one is that one. Then we get a whole pile of recitals, because there are, let's see, there are 19 CDs in here. So now we're already up to CD 17. Yeah, having done the Parsifals, oh joy. Um, the Vaison Donk Leader, and other things with Kirsten Flagstad. Now, this is from 56. It's only about a year before her um, Valkyra Act One, and she sounds like uh, a much, she's much fresher voiced, and I think the intimacy of, of the leader format suited her well, because she didn't have to project in quite the same way. The Vaison Donk Leaders is a legendary performance. They're excellent. And you get excerpts from Lohengrin and Parsifal. You get Ich sah das Kind. Oh, joy. I love that one. And Die Valkyra. And it, it's all fun. And it's just, it's just lovely. And then we have, let's see. Oh, this is, this is the, the George London recital. 
um, which is really, really good, really fun. You get uh, a bit of The Flying Dutchman, two bits of Meistersinger, and the amazing, amazing Die Valkyrie and, and final, final magic fire, you know, whatever scene thing that it's called there, which is, you know, Leibwald, Du Kunis, Herrliches Kind. Yeah, that's really great. And, you know, as long as George London is singing. But Kana's okay there. He really is. I mean, you just get used to the kind of, you know, um, on again, off again attacks and whatnot. But it doesn't, it doesn't distract you too badly. And then CD 19 is Richard Strauss, excer excerpts from Rosen Cavalier, and then some Tannhäuser, and some Meister Singer with Maria Reining and Paul Schiffler. And again, these are fun with the Tone Hollow Orchestra of Zurich. I mean, it's, it's just, you like those singers, you're going to enjoy the performances. Kna is along for the ride, and he's having a nice time. He's enjoying the ride. And that is the opera and vocal box. It was really very easy to deal with because there's only a limited number of material in it, and we can cover four discs at a time. So there you go. If you like your Kna, I think the best representation of him, frankly, is indeed to get the opera box. Even if he's only about, you know, 30 to 40 percent of the work that went into it or less. Who knows? You can decide for yourself just what percentage he deserves. Keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.